I step on the scale every day. Earlier this year, I was 10 pounds overweight, nothing fit right, I didn't look the way I wanted in the mirror, so I have been watching what I eat for several months, and I've been trying to get myself down to a more manageable weight, but checking my physical weight is easy, right? It's a simple thing for me to step on the scale and decide, all right, this is how much I weigh, because that number's indisputable. I can't argue with the scale or offer an excuse. If it says I weigh 169, I weigh 169, that's what I am. But when it comes to my spiritual life, I worry about that even more. What would it be like if I could step on a scale and then measure where I stood with God? You know, just put my spiritual baggage there, the, the weight of the world that I carry, the worry that I carry, that's harder to quantify. It's probably what guilt feels like. We all have that, right? Guilt, worry, it's, it creeps in, it whispers to you that you're not good enough, you haven't done enough, you don't measure up, and you stress out that you're not doing a good enough job. In fact, guilt can be so common, and you get so used to dragging it around, that it starts to pop up in every relationship, every challenge when you try something new, or every chance to move forward in your life, guilt holds you down, it holds you back. It's kind of like wearing ankle weights when you walk. You know, at first you're keenly aware, I have ankle weights on, but the more you do it, the more it just slows you down and you just get used to it. It just feels normal after a while. I know this because it's not just you. This isn't just something you're going through, it's, it's, it's me, it's all of us. We, we all have these feelings of guilt. When you survey Americans and you ask them why they feel guilty, uh, one survey came back with 1,515 results. Reasons, right, that they feel guilty. And then those reasons got categorized. They made 12 categories, and the most common were telling a lie, not spending enough time with loved ones, your religious beliefs, and your responsibilities. Here at the top of our study in Romans, we're looking at Romans chapter 8 today, we have some very good news for you. <laughs> Romans 8 verse 1 says, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What does condemnation mean? This is the Greek word, katak rima. And it means to declare guilty, or to inflict a penalty on, or to doom, or to say that this thing is unfit for use. So basically chapter 8 begins with, the Word of God says no guilt for those who are in Jesus. If you have trusted Jesus, you do not have to live with sin or guilt. Why does the chapter begin with the word therefore? because of the first seven chapters we just read, right? Paul's been clearly spelling this all out. God is holy, we are sinful. Yes, there is punishment for death and sin, but we have a perfect savior. Jesus died for your sins. He made everything right with God. He makes us holy by faith. Everything we've been talking about for the past six weeks. And then Paul says, in view of all of that, he sums up this message of God's love. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's the essence of who Jesus is, what he did. That is the central foundational message of God's love to the world. This is what we call the gospel. This is the good news that we announce. This is what we ring the bell as we walk through the neighborhoods. No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus shouting loudly as we walk the streets. Sounds pretty good. I bet that sounds really good, especially to those of us who feel riddled with guilt. So why do we still feel guilty? Well, I guess that question is best asked by another question. Why do we have the law if we are not bound to the law? because that guilty feeling comes from the law. 
That's why it's there. Let's say you're driving home from church today and you're listening to the radio and you're singing along with your favorite song and all of a sudden you see the flashing red and blue lights in your rear mirror. You pull over to the shoulder and the car pulls up behind you and the officer walks up and he says, do you know how fast you are going? Now, if you're on Walden Road, uh, from here to Walmart, you should be going 35 to 40, right? So right away, you know the officer's pulled you over for speeding. <laughs> so the next thing you can assume is, they're gonna give me a ticket, which means I'm gonna have some sort of fine. You are in violation of the law, and so therefore you have to pay a penalty. But you don't have to wait for the officer to walk up to you. The moment you saw the lights in your mirror, you knew that you were guilty. That's what the law does for us. It's there to remind us where the bar is. The law shows you guilt and then says you are without excuse. But Paul begins with, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So why is there no traffic ticket for us? Well, there was. But instead of the officer giving you the ticket, he gives it to Jesus. We are the ones who broke the law, but the punishment was taken by Jesus on the cross. Jesus took our punishment. Which takes us to a very popular question again. Why does Jesus have to die on a cross, right? Why all the, why all the hoops to jump through? If God loves us, why doesn't he just forgive us by snapping his finger? I mean, we're all human, we all make mistakes, God made me this way, and so, you know, he doesn't have to condemn me <laughs> for my mistakes because this is how he made me, right? Why, why, why does Jesus have to be the one to take the punishment? Last week, we looked at Genesis chapter 3, and we talked about Adam and Eve, and uh, they had one simple rule. Don't eat that fruit. <laughs> Don't eat the fruit of the tree uh, of good and evil, but if you do, you will die. Can you imagine <laughs> how lucky were they? They had one rule to live by. Now, today, we have 613 laws in the Old Testament. That's just one, one, stri one strict law. Don't eat the fruit, but if you do, you die. Well, we all know how that story turned out. They broke the rule, and as the first humans on the planet, they begin this cycle of sin and death and shame for every next generation. A condition that we are all born into, as Paul showed us last week, that we can't escape. But why didn't Adam and Eve die the moment they ate the fruit? I mean, did God change his mind? Did he change the conditions? No. Here's a, a verse that we did not read last week. Verse 21, for the Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments of skins and clothed them. See, that's interesting. One of the things that we always remember about Adam and Eve was that they were naked and they felt no shame. But once they sinned, they felt guilt and they felt shame and they hid from God the same way a child hides from their parents. And so, yes, God does punish them, but they don't immediately die. Instead, an animal is sacrificed and that skin covers their shame. So, in the Adam and Eve story, there is a law. That law is broken. There was a punishment. An animal took that punishment for the man and the woman a punishment that the man and woman deserved. And then the rest of the Bible story tells us how God tries to get us all back to the garden, to once again live in that perfect joy, to have that innocence once again, to one day be in total peace, what the Hebrews call shalom. God has to get us from point A to point B. And the story is not as simple as, well, Old Testament, New Testament. This is where Bible historians and theologians and people smarter than the two of us step in and they, they, they give us a big, big word. 
And for many of you, this will probably be a new word. Dispensationalism. Ooh, dispensationalism. What is that? That is the historical framework that breaks biblical history down into ages. The ages depict the various ways that God dealt with and led humanity. So here's the chart, right? The Garden of Eden is called innocence. And after the fall, we move to conscience. What does conscience mean? It means that people did what they thought was right, right? They, they had eaten from the tree of good and evil, so they know right and wrong, and they just go with their conscience. That didn't last very long, because that takes us to Noah's Ark and the flood. God wipes out all of humanity, starts over with Noah's family. Then God institutes the dispensation of human government and gives humanity the right to enact a punishment for a crime. Now, there is condemnation, but it's going to come from a ruler or a government that says, you broke the law, and therefore you pay the price or you die. Of course, human government fails and takes us to the Tower of Babel story. Humanity disobeys, and God's judgment is to confuse all the languages of the people and to scatter humanity to the ends of the earth. What's next? The patriarchs. We get Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and with that, we have a promise from God that one day there will be a chosen nation in a land of their own. But time after time, the people doubted the promise, and they disobeyed, which reminds us of stories like the golden calf and doubting the 12 spies when they returned from the promised land. And the condemnation came because people doubted. So God gave his people the law, right? And the people still doubted. They still disobeyed. So now punishment was 40 years walking in the desert. Under the law, animals have to die for your sins. Just like with Adam and Eve. An animal pays the price for our disobedience. And in the time of law, that lasts until Jesus. Why do you have all these time periods? What do all these seasons of biblical history show us? Well, one thing that it shows us is the absolute, utter impossibility of fixing the problem of sin. God gave us a conscience, we blew it. God gave us human government, we blew it. How about Law. Does anyone think we can get closer to God by following laws? Go to any major metro, you know, metropolis city and, and see if people there are obeying the law. So we are left with no hope in ourselves, no hope in government, no hope in laws. And before Jesus, every other system was called a substitutionary atonement. Ooh, another big word. Another big phrase that means something else takes the place of deserved punishment. In the case of the Jewish people, it was animals, usually goats or bulls or birds that were killed or offered up as a burnt offering to pay for your sins. One very important point about these sacrifices, in order for that animal to be acceptable to God, it had to be perfect, the best of the best, with no flaws, no weird markings, no defects, as physically perfect as possible. But the Bible says there was something wrong even with substitutionary atonement. Hebrews 10 says, For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered, since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any conscience of sins? But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Sacrifice cannot fix things, because no animal is really perfect. There is no perfect animal. And the animal didn't commit the sin, right? A, a human committed the sin. An animal can't even understand why it's being sacrificed. Therefore, if we wanted to truly be cleansed and healed from our sin and the sin nature, a human who understood would have to take the punishment. In other words, since no 
human had ever lived a sinless life, there is no perfect offering. There is no perfect sacrifice until Jesus. And it's all these big theological words that answer the question, why did Jesus die for me? Because he was perfect. In a few months, we'll be talking about Christmas and a baby born in a manger, about prophecy and kingly gifts and all those stories are told to explain that Jesus was born as one of us. He was born as a human. So right away, he is one of us. He is like us. He identifies with us. Hebrews 2 says, therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Hebrews 4 says, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The Christmas story also says that he is God. That's the difference. He is fully human and fully God. Not like a God, not a lesser God, not a separate God, not a mere prophet, not a mere teacher, not a savior like Moses. Jesus had to be all powerful because at the cross, he has to take the weight of every sin for all time upon himself. My favorite Christian author, John, John Piper puts it this way. Justification is an act of God, not man. It is a divine decision to acquit the guilty, to give all the benefits of the children of God to us who deserve hell. It is based on a transaction that happens outside of ourselves, namely the death of Jesus Christ in our place. The problem of sin that the history of scripture could not solve, Jesus solved. What was lost in the Garden of Eden, the connection, the intimacy, the shalom, it returns with a new promise, greater than Abraham's promise, returns with a new word, greater than any law, a new savior, greater than Moses, a new king, greater than David, a new firstborn son, a new Adam, a new and perfect lamb. What does that mean for us? Well, it means just like Paul says, there is now no condemnation. Then you should live with no condemnation. How? How do you get past that feeling of guilt? Let me read to you the first four verses of Romans, and you'll see that this is what we've been talking about. First, one through four, chapter eight. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So stop beating yourself up. The work has been done. It's been paid for. For the past sin and that future sin, stop beating yourself up. You, you know what they say? Guilt is the gift that keeps on giving. We keep guilting ourselves. And we make ourselves feel lousy. We condemn ourselves and criticize and berate ourselves. And we say things like, I shouldn't have done that. I should be better. I'm so stupid. I can't believe I did that again. Psalm 38 says, for my iniquities have gone over my head like a heavy burden. They are too heavy for me. It's self-punishment. And it comes in all forms. Illness is one. You can make yourself sick from worry. Depression is another self-inflicted punishment. You can wallow in pity and failure. Ask any marriage counselor how often they see in a relationship where people say, I don't deserve to be happy. 
Suicide is the number one killer of college students. It's the number two killer of high school students. Why? Because even people at that young age feel condemned. But beating yourself up doesn't fix your pain. It just keeps the wound open. Paul reminds us that only in Christ can we find relief. Jesus, cross, Jesus Christ was nailed to a cross so that, you could, so that you would stop nailing yourself to a cross. Jesus Christ is, was crucified so you can stop crucifying yourself. Ask God to help you stop hurting yourself. We beat ourselves up and we allow other people to beat us up. Stop letting others beat you up. It's bad enough that we have a judge in the mirror, you know, but we, we also allow other voices to hurt us as well. When you were growing up, it might have been a parent. It might have been the school bully. Later on in life, it could have been a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Even later, it could be a best friend or a boss or your spouse or your ex. And you know what? You may never be able to change what they say and do. But you can change how you respond to them. Determine today that you're not going to let anybody steal that which belongs to God, namely your value. You are a child of God, and God says you have worth. He is your creator. You are not your own. First Peter says that he paid for you with the precious lifeblood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. Eleanor Roosevelt said, nobody can make you feel inferior without your permission. You decide what attacks roll off of you. Tell yourself, that's not going to work on me anymore. I will not give that person the ability to do what only God can do. I will not let them make me feel inferior. Ask God to give you a strong mind, a strong spirit to withstand the attacks against you. But maybe you're thinking, I wish I could believe that. I just feel so unworthy. I, I know the things that I have done. That's where God's love comes in. Stop resisting God's love. Remember, guilt only has one purpose, to drive you to repentance. That's it. After that, there's nothing else good that comes of it. Adam and Eve felt shame and they hid from God. Even though God knew what they did and he still called out for them. Don't let your guilt drive you away from God. Don't allow guilt to lead you to embarrassment and shame. Guilt should drive you towards God, not away from him. And if you've only memorized John 3, 16, do yourself a favor and memorize the next verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God did not send his son into the world to condemn it, but to save it. Listen, God knows who you are and he still loves you. That's the amazing grace we sing about. We all deserve to be pronounced guilty, but instead, now there is no condemnation. It's not about what you've done, it's about what God has done. He made the first move and he's waiting for you to respond with love. Stop resisting. Stop feeling like you can't go to him because of shame. He sees you. He sees where you're hiding. That's why Paul reminds us, now there is no condemnation. That word condemnation, it's a very interesting one. Not only does it have to do with judgment, but it also refers to a piece of land that perhaps has a prior claim. Sometimes we feel like that, that maybe this religion thing didn't fully take and that we're still under the ownership of another. Maybe there's some lean on our lives. Paul says there's none. Your life is free and clear from everything, everything. He says, once you trust Jesus, you are his and his alone. Second Corinthians 5, 17 says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Where do you need to start getting rid of that condemnation? Spend some minutes in prayer. Maybe you need to stop resisting God's love. Give up, just give up. Come out from behind the trees and say, Jesus, I need you to take away my sin and replace it with your grace. Forgive me and heal me for all eternity. Maybe you need to ask God to 
help you stop beating yourself up. You know, he's already forgiven you. Why can't you forgive you? Maybe you need to start to ask God for strength, to stop letting someone else beat you up. Ask God for a new vision of who he created you to be. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to listen to your word today and to have the reminder that there is now no condemnation, that you do not see us the same way that we see ourselves. When we look in the mirror, we see all of the hurts and all of the hangups that continually mess up our life. We see every imperfection and we see every flaw. And we allow every negative voice, whether it's in the world or the people around us, to hurt us and to influence us. May we learn to put away those voices and to listen only to you, to listen to the words of our Heavenly Father, to get our value and our worth from you and to listen to you and to you alone. Amen. Thank you all for listening today.